All right, so how do you know if your cell phone battery is ready to be replaced? Um, back in the day, you know, I mean, the most obvious thing you would look for, of course, is you're not getting the kind of standby or uh, usage out of it that you used to, and they, those kind of diminish over time. But back in the day, we used to take the phone out of the battery, and you can see that they physically swelled up when they got to the point where they were going bad. Basically, they start releasing gases inside of the battery. So um, now that phones are generally made with batteries that are not removable, it's a lot more difficult to do that. And one of the problems is, is that since the batteries do still expand over time, uh, and there's really nowhere for them to go because they're sealed inside the phone, a lot of times they will just kind of push through the back or they'll pop the screen off of the front of the phone, which is not a good thing. You know, um, I've had so many customers come in and their phone looks like it is exploding from the inside out. So obviously that can create all sorts of weird problems. So um, one of the things I wanna to do today is show you a helpful tool as soon as the dog starts barking or stops barking. So give me just a second and I'll get him to calm down real quick and I'll be back. Oh, look, he stopped. Okay, so give me one second. All right, so if you have problems with barking dogs or uh, also aggressive dogs, I should say, I don't want anybody to get this wrong, I would never use this on a dog, but for some reason, dogs do not like the sound of these little uh, zapper things. So this is a flashlight that also has a stun gun deal built into it. And if you just make this sound, you can hold it up in the air and that will usually be enough to discourage your dog from barking or uh, an aggressive dog that's approaching you or anything like that. Again, I don't um, condone using this on an animal, but just the sound of it will generally deter them. So that comes in pretty handy. So getting back to the battery, what I wanted to show you was a very helpful piece of software that you can get if you have a Mac or OS X device. Uh, this, is general, this is basically designed for Apple computers. Uh, there is something like it for Windows, but I'm on a Mac today, so it'll be easiest for me to show you it, uh, show you this version, and then later on, uh, probably next week, I'll get this set up on my Windows machine so you can see it also. So this is called Coconut Battery, and I will put a link down at the bottom of the video description so you can see where to get this. And what this will do is it'll show you some different information about your MacBook. So you can see here on mine, it shows the model number, uh, manufacturer date, the full charge capacity. So basically where it says current charge, it's showing right now that we have 5306, so 5300 milliamp hours out of a uh, charge capacity of 8667. Now this particular laptop was designed with a capacity of 8755. So you can see that we have pretty close to what the original spec was. So I, you know, potentially I could have got 8755, but right now I can get up to 8667. And over time, that number will diminish. It'll start to drop down a little bit as the uh, computer gets older and older. So, and then you can see right there where it says 5342, that's basically 64% of the full charge capacity that it's showing me. And then there's some other information down there at the bottom. You have the manufacturer date, the cycle count. So uh, my understanding is that means that the battery has been charged and discharged or the equivalent of that process 13 times. It's saying that the Mac OS X battery status is good, battery temperature is 98 and so forth. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that you have, if you have a iPhone and you plug it into the USB, which I'm gonna do here, shortly give me just a second if we go ahead and plug our iphone into the same computer where we have this installed you know click the trust prompt when it comes up and then go over to i'm gonna have to move some things around here go over to this coconut battery and where it says this mac up at the top you'll see there are two other tabs one of them is history and that's going to show you anything that you've uh, recorded, you know, over time, if you want to keep track of how long your battery lasts and how long it takes to degrade and so forth. But if we click over here all the way on the right hand side, you'll see that we have iOS device. Now this is my iPhone 7 that's plugged in. And just below that you see the uh, manufacturer's model number, which is 9,1, the manufacturer date, the iOS version, space use and so forth. But most importantly, down about halfway through there, it says current charge is 1000 milliamps out of a full charge capacity of 1863, where the design capacity was 1960, which is 
uh, you know, a good indication that you were at X percentage of what, of what the potential for this battery to hold was. That's pretty decent. I'm not in a pos position where I would say it's a good idea to replace my battery at this point in time. But if you're wondering whether or not your battery might be a problem or how soon it may be, need to be replaced, or if you are selling batteries, you know, if you have customers that come into your store, if you're in the phone repair business and you want to show them a visual representation of their battery health, this is a really easy way to do it. You just grab the phone and say, you know, how's your battery? Um, and most people will say it's not as good as it was when they bought it, but you know, that's usually the case, but uh, not necessarily, ne necessarily justification for replacing it right then and there. Although later, as this thing tends to diminish, you can get an idea of the number of cycle counts and what uh, full charge capacity is as a percentage of the design capacity. So with the cycle count, there are a couple different opinions that I've heard uh, from different places, but the general idea is that most lithium ion or lithium polymer batteries should get you about 500 full cycles. Now that won't be at 100% health because over time, hey, what's up Caesar? Um, there's a time delay on here. So I'm kind of gonna lag probably about 10 or 15 seconds, but good to see you on. So I hope you caught that stuff. This coconut battery is awesome if you have a Mac. Um, next week, I'll be demoing uh, 3U tools. In the meantime, if you want to look it up and check it out for Windows, this gives you some of the similar information that you can get from here. So, uh, you know, again, if you want to determine more definitively whether or not it's time to replace a battery instead of guessing, and obviously we don't want to have to open up the phone and see if the battery's swollen. So if you get to that point in time, uh, then there are worse things that can happen. Hopefully your phone doesn't explode on you. All right. So, um, my name is Mike and I am with GoCellPhoneRepair.com. If you just joined anyone out there or if you jump into the podcast at this point, um, I was doing an audio podcast weekly on my website. And the thing about that was it was missing a few things, you know, one of them being a visual representation because it's, it's one thing to talk about something, but if people can't really see what you're saying, then it doesn't make quite as much, much sense. And up until now, I really didn't have an option on that because my internet speed sucked. You know, if you ever call up your ISP and you ask about, uh, ban you know, um, what the speed is available in your area, they will always talk to you in terms of how fast you can download things. Well, the problem is you don't generally get very much, like you get a small percentage of that download speed on the upstream. And that's what I've been waiting for. Like it took forever, but it finally got here. I don't know, they finally got fiber from the node out to the street or to the house or however that it is that that works. So this was my original intention was to kind of do this stuff where we can one, uh, show things on the screen and also have people participate because, you know, I'll do my podcast and I'll ask a rhetorical question or a real question or I'll say, you know, what do people think about this? But there's no way for anybody to answer back to me. So the whole idea behind this is that hopefully uh, if you have questions, comments, ideas, and I'm always open to new ideas and hearing them from people, uh, we're learning stuff every day in this business. You know, I've been doing this since 1994 and not a week goes by that I don't learn something new. So I am a perpetual student. I want to learn as much about phone repair as I can and get as good as I can. And uh, hopefully you do too. So I want to talk about batteries just for another second if I can find this deal that of course I didn't set down before I moved. Uh, let's see where I put it. Well, I might have to come back to that later. I thought it had it sitting right in front of me and it does not appear to be. So we may come back to that one later on. Okay, next thing was, uh, what is the best toolkit? So this is a question that keeps coming up like over and over. Uh, hi, Jose, no problem, thanks for joining. So uh, if you replace a battery, would you have to flash the firmware or reset the phone in order to have the correct cycle count? No, you shouldn't have to do anything to the battery or the phone. The cycle count should be accurate. There is one caveat that I would put out there though, and that is there are ways to reset that cycle count. So if you were dealing with a less than scrupulous uh, battery company who sold batteries and knew that this was a factor, there is actually a way to go in to reset that. So um, that's usually the only time that we really run into any questions about whether or not the cycle count is accurate and hopefully we're doing business with honest people and that's not happening. If it is, you'll find out shortly after because your battery just doesn't last very long. But as far as getting a new battery off the shelf and putting it into your phone, you shouldn't have to, um, you shouldn't have to calibrate or reset anything. Hi, Mr. Cruiser, tell me please. Um, 
uh, what I don't yeah, I don't didn't get the question but if you have one by all means uh, post it up there um, as far as the batteries though there are a couple things um, that I do normally tell people there's since battery technology has changed so much over the last couple decades we still get customers who will often ask the same questions you know one of the most popular ones is if you have a battery that you just bought do you have to run it down and then charge it up all the way and that's kind of a left leftover thinking from the nickel cadmium era because we used to have batteries that would develop what they call the memory effect and that would mean that if you used your battery for uh, let's say an hour and then you put your phone back on the charger and then you used it for an hour again and back and forth eventually the the battery would sort of remember that it's supposed to be running for an hour before you put it back on the charger and it would develop that memory effect and then you would have to recycle the battery you know drain it all the way down and charge it all the way up in order to remove that effect uh, as long as it hasn't set in there too badly now with lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries that is not supposed to be the case in fact i recommend um, that you don't actually run your batteries all the way down it is not healthy for lithium batteries to be discharged all the way to zero it's absolutely not necessary and it and can in fact shorten the lifespan of your battery um, and the odd thing about them is that lithium ion batteries are designed to charge at least if you have it on the proper charger most of the ones that you see in phones now are designed to charge rapidly so you should get a um, 90 percent charge or so after about an hour to hour and a half maybe two hours but if you go from the 90 percent level up to 100 percent it tends to take a lot longer because what the battery will start doing at that time um, they have some circuitry built into the battery itself in order to safeguard it from being overcharged. And if you leave the battery charged in, as it starts to go up, you know, from 90% approaching 100, it, if it gets to about 96, 97, it will actually stop and allow the battery to discharge slightly in order to prevent that potential of overcharging from happening. So when you get to that last 10 percentile, you're going to kind of be going up and down and up and down. It's going to take a very long time to get to 100%. You don't necessarily need to get your battery up to 100% to get that extra 10 or 15 minutes or whatever it is uh, out of it. So they recommend, you know, if you get down to your low battery warning or your battery says 15% or so, by all means, throw it on the charger. Once you get up to 90%, you're good. You don't really need to leave it on there to try to get that last 100, you know, that last 10% on there. And there was one other thing right along those lines. Let's see, my battery is losing, losing overall power and maximum charge. Uh, can you help me? Well, um, like I was saying, I wouldn't worry too much about the maximum charge. You don't have to worry about getting to 100%. And another indication that a battery is going bad is that it will actually charge more rapidly than it did before. So you might get a new battery that, let's say it takes an hour and a half to charge. As it starts to decrease its capacity, it will actually charge faster, making you think, oh, this is a great battery. You know, it charged up in 30 minutes. Well, that's because there's not that much energy being stored in the cells anymore because they're losing their capability to do that. Now, if you have a battery that's losing overall power, um, I would assume that to mean standby time or usage time that you're getting from it. There's not a lot you can do other than replace the battery. So again, it's not like the old NICADs where you have to discharge it and recharge it to try to re resurrect it. It's probably going to continue to lose more and more uh, standby time. And eventually you just have to replace the thing. And hopefully it doesn't start swelling up inside your phone, especially if you have one that's sealed inside of uh, you know, like any iPhone or Galaxy for the most part, these days you're not going to be able to see that the battery is expanding on the inside. So if you've had your phone, usually it's about a year and a half to two years. It's probably a good time to start looking at um, new batteries. And I don't know, uh, Mr. Cruiser, what kind of phone do you have? Do you have an iPhone or do you have something else? Because um, if you were with us earlier, I was kind of explaining how you can get this uh, coconut battery, which is a free download, and it'll tell you where your battery is at exactly. So I did want to go into um, a little bit about tools because these questions keep coming up and really the answers will change over time as well. Oh, Samsung Galaxy S3. I would say if you if it looks like you're getting less and less standby time, um, think about replacing the battery. The S3 batteries are probably about eight or nine dollars now uh, online and that'll probably save you a lot of time and energy and lucky you, you can actually take the back off your phone. So if you take your battery out of the phone and you lay it down on a flat surface. This is this is our old home remedy method for testing batteries that we can take out of the phone. Take the battery, set it down on a flat surface and give it a spin, okay? Batteries should be flat on the bottom and flat on the top. And if you spin it, it should immediately stop. If your battery has a, a high point in the center, you know, if it's swelling up, 
right in the middle, it's going to make it a little taller. So when you spin it around on the table, it just keeps going and going and going. And anytime we saw that, we tell people it's time to replace your battery because they're not supposed to spin around indefinitely like that. We call them break dancers. So if you have a break dancer battery, by all means, get one. Way to go. Um, okay. So I came across this a while back. I've actually had a few people send me some toolkits and uh, I wanted to qualify this question a little bit because a lot of people will say, what is, you know, I'm getting into phone repair or I've been buying onesie twosie stuff and I just want to buy a toolkit. What's the best thing to get? And of course the, uh, there you go. You got a spinner. That's, that's time to dispose of and get another one. Um, <laughs> break dancer. Exactly. So if you're looking for tools, um, there are two things that people generally look for. One is going to be quality. Obviously that's kind of at the top of my list or for anyone who is going to be doing repairs on a regular basis, you want to have good tools that you don't have to keep replacing. Now, on the other hand, there is always going to be a group of people who really don't do a lot of phone repairs. You know, they might want to have something in their tool kit so that if they have to take a phone apart, they can, but they're not doing this every day and their tools aren't going to wear out. And there's really not a good argument for investing a lot of money and buying the best that there is out there. But with that said, I'm going to say that uh, recently, uh, or, or at least as of today, there are two toolkits that I recommend people take a look at. If you're looking for something that includes most of the drivers that you're going to need, and there's always going to be an exception when it comes to iPhones, because every time we have a new iPhone, there's a new driver you have to buy and nobody seems to include it in their kits. I'm not sure if that's a proprietary thing or what's going on. But um, definitely take a look at the iFixit toolkit. They have the ProTech toolkit. I actually have one uh, laying around here somewhere and I should have thought this out earlier. But in any case, it's uh, I think it's got about like 40 or 60 bits in it and it will have most of the bits that you'll ever need to repair phones. Again, with the exception of the standoff screwdriver for pulling iPhone boards. Uh, it will have a Pentalo, but it won't have the 2.5 millimeter hex for the iPhone 6S and it I am pretty sure it doesn't have the tri-lobe driver for the iPhone 7, which is the new one that, uh, again, every time, I think that when the iPhone 8 comes out, there's probably going to be yet another screwdriver that we need to get. So if someone got that together and could sell all those drivers in one kit, that would be awesome. I had a uh, vendor, and this is not an endorsement. I'm not doing this video as a review, but I did want to mention it because I had someone send me a really nice kit. And of course, I try to be as skeptical as I can when I test these out because I don't want to come on here and make everything sound like, you know, uh, puppy dogs and ice cream about any particular product. I always try to find the worst things that I can and point that out. And uh, I mentioned some things about this. Uh, this is probably a couple months back. But honestly, overall, this is a very good kit, okay? This is uh, called Scandi Tech. I don't know if you can see it. The lighting's a little goofy in here. But I like this for a very small startup kit. If you don't know how many phones you're gonna be working on or to what extent you'll be doing phone repair, or even if you are a tech and you just wanna have something that's easy to wrap up and carry with you, this thing comes with most of the bits that we ever use. So uh, I don't wanna get that too. Whoops, just dropped the uh, pry tool there. But this thing has quite a few in it. It's got uh, every Torx. It even has the security Torx that use on Xboxes. It's got uh, three different penelobes, 0.8, 1.2, 1.5. Of course, all of your uh, Phillips and your Torx bits in here. So uh, it comes with a, something that looks like an Isesimo. It's got a metal spudger up here, which uh, anyone who has not seen this before, I will tell you right now that, um, let me see this chat here, can I ask a uh, you can, Tiffany, give me just a second and I'll try to answer my question as good as I, uh, that question as well as I can. Um, so this is something that if you haven't seen it, they, they call it a metal spudger and this comes in a lot of kits and I have found, okay, since the very first iPad ever came out, we've got the G, the G tool, we've got the plier tech, we've got all sorts of different uh, tools that are designed to basically re-bend the corners of the iPads. I got to tell you, this so far is my favorite. If you secure your tablet against a corner, you know, you need a 90 degree angle, something like that. You set the tablet in that corner and use this with a rubber mallet or a hammer and just very gently tap out the corners. It has almost the exact shape that you need. And doing it by hand, in my opinion, gives you a little more control over, uh, you know, as opposed to the plier tech or the G tool, which tend to slip off the lip and have a number of different problems. So it's kind of cool that they included that in this toolkit. Uh, let's see, so where are we? Can I ask a question regarding M1? 
Yes, again, I hope that I can answer it for you. Um, what is the response time for replacing tools from the iFixit kits? That is a good question, Harvey, because I had an iFixit kit. Uh, I work for, for a company that does a lot of repairs and we train a lot of technicians. So we bought quite a few of the iFixit kits and um, short answer is I don't know what their turnaround is, but I do know that of, of the kits that we got for the iFixit Protex, the magnets kept falling out. We had a couple, two or three where the magnets just fell out of the out of the driver itself. So we were gonna mess with an RMA and you know we figured it ended up being a few dollars. They actually have a place on their site where you can just buy the driver itself and that's what we did to get it replaced. Um, everything I've heard about iFixit from our warehouse person who handles all those orders seems, um, it seems as if they're pretty good about getting back to you quick and getting things taken care of uh, as soon as possible, but I don't know the exact turnaround time. I can find out and if I do, I'll definitely post it down here somewhere under the video. Um, Let's see. Hello, Brazil. Uh, good, good, Lily. Okay, so cool. Yeah, um, M1 jumper. Uh, Tiffany, I'm not sure what your question is. Oh, here we go. Okay, instead of actually running the jumper, method is to scratch the surface trace and just tin the trace instead of adding the jumper. The results have been perfect. Okay, um, that's awesome. It, it's not a question, but that's great because I'd rather hear more about the M1 jumper. I don't have as many six pluses coming in anymore, but the ones where I've added the M1 jumper, fortunately have not come back. I'm gonna knock on some wood here if I can. So um, definitely credit to, I wanna say it was Chris Long. It may be someone else. So I hope I'm crediting the right person, but whoever came up with the M1 jumper and the time that they invested in figuring out why that particular pad was a problem, bravo, props to them. Tiffany, thanks for your suggestion. Um, I, I know there's a lot of skepticism about scratching the surface. Uh, there are a few people out there who do a lot of micro soldering that are uh, highly opposed to scratching for any reason. But obviously if it's been working for you and they're not coming back, then that's an indication. And really, I think, I think that we're nearing, uh, the end of the life cycle for the six plus that probably within the next six months to a year, but, um, Again, I think the way that also the way that the phone is designed, even if you run the perfect jumper over time, that phone will get bent, you know, unless you just take really good care of it. So there's always a possibility that something else is going to detach under that um, under that chip. Um, can I watch back this stream? Yes, you can watch this stream later on. So I will leave this stream on the channel. I know that not everyone can jump in here at two o'clock on Monday. So for those of you that have, thank you very much. For those of you that have work to do, I totally understand. Um, and again, this was kind of an idea that I had to where you don't necessarily have to be sitting in front of the computer, but if you want to listen to the, just the audio or you want to download this, I will have the audio extracted and that'll be available on iTunes, Google Music, and everywhere else that you can get my podcast. It ended up on Last FM. I didn't even know what that was or how it got there, but apparently it's getting shared or something like that. So um, Scandi Tech, I would consider. I fix it for sure. If you're looking for quality though, I have to say that in the last five or six years, I really haven't changed my position on quality screwdrivers, and that's gonna be Vera and Viha. So these are German companies, and as you know, Germans are basically notorious for over-engineering things. They make things like way better and way more to specification that it's even necessary. So when you buy their tools, for the most part, you're getting very good quality and good precision stuff. So um, the Vera, which is, let me grab, I have a couple here. And these are actually spelled, these are actually spelled with a W. So my understanding is that the pronunciation is Vera, but it's W-E-R-A. And these are a couple of the ones that I use. If you haven't seen them before, they have this big green handle on them. Um, I really would like it if they had different colored handles because that makes things a lot easier when you're reaching for a driver. You know, you don't have to read anything or try to look at the tip carefully, but I've been using these for the last couple of years and they work great. And of course they use, they make that uh, Craftform Micro, which is like the Cadillac of screwdrivers with the, um, the ratcheting built in so you don't over torque it and that thing runs like 120 bucks. But really these for the price, I think they're about 10, seven, eight, $10 a piece. These are awesome. Also Weha um, or Viha, as you have probably heard of, they make really good tools and I would highly recommend if you're getting drivers and you're gonna be doing this for any period of time, especially when you're dealing with things like pentalobe screws, where 
your driver has got to be precise. And if you slip just a tiny bit, now you have a strip screw, and I think I'm gonna do an entire video on strip screws because there are so many things that can go wrong. Um, awesome, from Hungary. All right, well, cool. I will definitely have this up on the channel so you can check it out later. Thanks for joining us, though. Uh, what time is it in Hungary? So, um, yeah, and as we look at a couple of other things, and this is something I was doing, I was attempting to do under the microscope yesterday, and I found that it's very difficult to take still image photographs under the microscope. But another thing that I've been hearing from a lot of people is that they are having problems with the iPhone 7s when they go to remove those inner screws. So those tri-lobe screws, excuse the uh, package noise here. Okay, so those tri-lobe screws that are on the inside of the iPhone 7, you know, no matter how careful you are, there's a good possibility that someone else is going to work on that phone later on, and then you might end up having it come into your store, which really sucks. So we've had a few techs that already have run into this problem. You know, you open up an iPhone 7, and you can see someone's already been inside there, and the screws, the screws are so easy to strip. If you haven't already done it, you have to be really, really careful. So um, what I would say is, uh, again, unfortunately, I couldn't get a really good photo of this under the microscope, but from what I can tell, it looks like, and I've got bunches of these. You know, I, I, ordered, I ordered every type of, of the uh, tri-lobe screws, that, uh, screwdrivers that I could find, and I think the bottom line is that these are probably not machined to the same specs that Apple has. So if you could get a hold of one of these from Apple, that would be awesome, but we also know that it's never going to happen. So the the drivers that we get they work well enough but i'm not going to say that i've come across a single one yet that was great so uh if i could give you one bit of advice when it comes to your first time you know removing a screw from an iphone 7 i find that's really helpful and comes with a, a small amount of risk and that is placing a small amount of pressure downwards on the driver so that it kind of locks into the screw now as you can imagine the problem with that is if your hand slips and your driver ends up going somewhere else, you might stab the battery, you know, you can damage something else inside the phone. So you've got to be really, really careful. But I have noticed that if you just apply a very small amount of downward pressure and make sure you keep this thing steady at the bottom, it makes it easier to grip the screw as you're unwinding it. And then, of course, when we go to put it in, we don't want to torque this thing down really hard because if we have to open up the phone for any other reason, it's going to be very difficult to get inside. In addition to that, I do want to point out, and I'm going to do, and I've actually got a freshly broken iPhone 7. I'm not going to do the screen today, but I will be doing it later this week because I want to go into great detail under the microscope about the home button because we've been having a number of uh, people throughout the repair community, you know, our techs, other techs, people who have been doing this for a very long and who are very good at what they do, ending up with problems with the iPhone 7 home button after the repair. And I think I have a pretty good idea why that is. But one thing I wanted to add about putting these screws in is that when you put that last screw in behind the home button itself on the iPhone 7, you want to be very careful not to over tighten that. My understanding is that too much pressure on that screw can also cause problems with the home button. And that's just one of a number of things that can go wrong with that phone. So yeah, we're starting to say that this is the phone that is going to kind of separate the casual or more amateur technicians from people who really uh, pay attention to detail and have a level of precision that you need to get these phones fixed because they're not getting any easier for the most part. All right, so let's see. Uh, Mr. Cruiser, I have an old iPod Touch second gen and it got disabled. It says connect to iTunes. I did that and it did not work. The only choice is to factory reset. Is there any other way I can get, the pa get rid of the password? Uh, yes, on the second gen, I think on the second gen, I'm going to have to pull it up. So, um, if you don't mind, I don't have it right in front of me, but there is a way to bypass the disabled screen on an iPod. It will not give you the passcode uh, unless it's an iPod Touch 4th Gen and a four digit numeric, but do a Google search for Gecko Toolkit. In fact, if you look on my channel, it's Gecko Toolkit. It's one of my older videos. It's been out for several years. And I wanna say that the bypass disabled will work with the second gen iPod. Again, it won't recover your password, but basically if you can bypass the disabled screen, you'll have unlimited number of attempts. And just shoot me a message. If it ends up being supported, I'll get you a copy of that so you can try it out. And hopefully that'll solve your problem. You will need some very specific parameters set up on your computer though, that's the only catch. But uh, yeah, before you reset it, there may be a way to get that working again. 
Uh, Tiffany Potts, I really enjoy your podcast. I especially enjoyed January 30th, which covered the running of my shop and focusing on offering the best repair services uh, rather than entering price wars. Thank you. I, I'm really happy if anyone finds something useful about this, you know. Um, believe it or not, I don't really enjoy, enjoy just talking to myself. So again, that's why it's really cool to have people in front of me here. I like this way better than just sitting there and talking into a microphone and hoping that someone out there is getting something useful out of it. So thank you. I really do appreciate it. It makes a big difference. Uh, hello, Milos. What are, uh, Harvey, what are your opinions on buying spare screws from AliExpress? Okay, here's the thing that kills me, and I haven't bought any from AliExpress, but I assume that they probably come from the same source that most replacement screws do. And I have purchased replacement screw sets on eBay for all sorts of iPhones before, and the thing that makes me insane is they put them all in a little tiny plastic baggie all mixed up. Now, you know how close in size some of those screws and thread sizes are. It, you know, you can't tell by just looking at them. So I don't know what you're supposed to do. You can find the pentalobes. You can identify some of the smaller ones and some that are similar. But there's a few screws inside those baggies that you just don't know. Uh, I would be confident that you can buy those, those uh, screws from AliExpress, but good luck sorting them out. You know, you'd really have to have an original or be very patient and diligent about trying those screws out in the phone and make sure you're not cross-threading something and make sure you're not setting yourself up for long screw damage or anything else like that. But my preferred method would be to have a comparable donor phone on hand. And if you're working with repairing a lot of phones, you will probably over time accumulate lots and lots of spare phones. So what you do is you generally go into the back and you say, I need this particular screw that I lost or it ended up on the floor and you take it out of one of your donor phones and you replace it immediately. And by the way, um, not talking directly to you, but for anyone else out there, if you're a tech or you're becoming a tech, you will want to have a smooth floor if possible. So wood floors, uh, linoleum, tile floors, anything like that. If you're working on carpet, there are a number of different problems that you can run into. One of them is gonna be electrostatic discharge. So while I don't always use an ESD mat when I'm working on foams, that's because I'm in a relatively you know, static electricity uh, free environment. Now, if you put carpeting inside of your tech area, one, it's gonna be very difficult to find your screws on the floor and two, you're going to dramatically increase the chances of building up electrostatic uh, or building up elect static electricity and then you go in and touch somebody's phone or if you're working on something very sensitive like a computer, especially RAM processors, uh, any type of game consoles, you don't want that electricity in there. So um, if if you do have carpet, I would highly recommend you're, you, you're grounded all the time when you're working and whatever it is that you're ground, you know, whatever it is that you're working on, you ground the case as well. Secondly, it's going to make it very difficult to find screws when they drop. So uh, by having a wood, linoleum, or tile floor, I have all my techs, as soon as they get to the store in the morning, they sweep the entire floor. And then the moment something drops, all you have to do is grab a broom and you go through and you sweep up and you find whatever it is that you're looking for most of the time. I know sometimes it rolls under the counter, which becomes very awkward, but anytime I go into a store, I'll grab the broom and if I sweep up and I find a bunch of extra screws, I start asking people like, what is this screw from? You know, why is this screw on the floor? There's really no excuse unless the phone is just dead and we're giving up on it. But even then, we should put the screws back inside so we'll have kind of a guide for next time that we need to pull them out. So uh, I hope that helps. Um, all right, so real quick here, I do want to talk about something that has probably been brought up before, and in case you run across it, if anyone's kind of on the fence at this point about this, uh, CTIA is coming up, and this year it is actually going to be in the Bay Area, which is where I live, San Francisco Bay Area, and I will not be going for a number of reasons, and I wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. Uh, obviously, you make your own decision, but uh, an educated decision is always the best one to make. So. For one thing, awesome. Um, so for one thing, I was talking to Mr. Cruiser. This is gonna get really confusing on the podcast because this will be totally out of context, but whatever. So uh, for one thing, I went to the CTIA conference back in 2014 and long story short, it was probably something that if I didn't know anything about the wireless industry, I would have attended. It was more focused on technology, carriers, brands, and stuff like that. They had a very small section for repair stuff, and they had a couple of conferences where they were talking about repairs. And we went to a couple of those, and they were they really just ended up being a big sales pitch for the companies that were representing or who were sponsoring those conferences. So 
or those uh, whatever you want to call them little meetings they had during the day. So from that from that perspective, I didn't gain much from it. Now, it was in Las Vegas, so really, for me, any excuse to go to Las Vegas is fine. Uh, not to mention that every vendor that we had was sending us free invitations saying, hey, we'll pay to get you into CTIA, and we're like, hey, you know, it's cool, it's free. We go inside, if we don't like it, we leave. Well, this year, number one, they are charging $300 admission. So you definitely wanna weigh that into whether or not you wanna take the trip to San Francisco, pay for your hotel, travel costs, take time off of work, and drop another $300 on a conference that really isn't designed to be focused on the repair industry, but in addition, um, in addition is rather opposed to it from what I can tell. So this is something that you might've already seen. This is a letter that was written from the CTIA organization to a senator in Nebraska back when they were uh, trying to work on the right to repair legislation. And what they really said is that they are concerned that this bill, which would support right to repair, which is what we need, which is what we are in the business of doing, that that bill would jeopardize compute, uh, consumer safety and security is unnecessary and compromises intellectual property. Uh, for those reasons, we must oppose this legislation. Customer safety, security, and privacy are fundamental goals, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you, you get, the, you get the, uh, the idea here. We know how to fix phones. We've been doing it for a long time. None of us have really been injured to a serious degree, but they're going, the, pe the very people that are putting on this conference, that they're trying to sell us tickets to attend and saying that, oh, we've got this little space over here for the repair industry are publicly stating that they are opposed to the right to repair. So again, I don't want to make anyone's decision for them, but if that's something that you want to weigh in consideration, again, you know, if you're kind of on the fence about it, definitely worth thinking about, you know, do we want to send money to people who are opposed to what it is that we do for a living? Um, Harvey, you love your videos. From watching your videos, I was able to replace the rear housing of my iPhone SE. Oh, cool. So did you do the custom housing or did you just do a replacement housing? I'm curious as to why your SE housing had to be replaced because uh, one thing about the 5 Series and the SE is that they're a lot stronger than the iPhone 6 was. So I don't know if it was bent or you did a custom or what, but that's awesome. Um, I'm tr My goal really on my channel for the tutorials is not to focus for technicians. So I know that uh, a lot of you already have plenty of experience and you're probably putting on, on, you know, playing the video twice as fast so you can get through it. But when I started this channel, I wanted to make sure that I did how to's that anyone could follow. So I try to really put a level of detail on there so that people can't come back and say, Hey, you didn't show me this part. You didn't show me that. And it really, that's kind of what um, inspired me to create this channel is trying to watch some of the other how to videos out there and, and they weren't complete. So uh, awesome. I'm glad you got that back together and it worked. And I'm really thinking right now that for those of you who are techs already, um, maybe I'll do two separate tutorials on every repair. You know, maybe just do one that is full detail. You've never touched that phone before. You get every little bit there is. And then maybe another one that's just like a five minute video that steps you through the process. Kind of like one of the things I like about iFixit on their website is that they have still images that you can kind of go through, but they have so many of them, you know, it's like you're constantly scrolling. So I think if we had something that was just like, take out these two screws, open this up, take this out and so forth on a video format, maybe that would work. I don't know. I'll uh, definitely explore that. Uh, original SE housing had a severe manufacturing defect. Wow. That's kind of lame. I bought an empty rear housing, no screws, and just transfer the bits to a new one. Okay, cool. Uh, that's weird, though. I'm assuming it was out of warranty, or you would have taken it back, right? But uh, cool. All right, so let's see. The iPhone 8 may be delayed. Let me see if I can get this browser up here. And I'm not sure how much of this I can really... Uh, I don't know too much about... Uh, what do you call it? Fair use. I know that you can show some things, but you can't show every little detail. So I'm not going to show this whole website, but this is from Forbes. And they're saying that the iPhone leak reveals Apple's new problems. And long story short, I just want to kind of summarize it for you. They're saying that the iPhone 8 may not actually be out until next year. And they're talking about possibly doing away with uh, Touch ID. And I didn't really didn't understand all this article because there's a section where he kind of says that. Let's see if we can find this here. Are you going to scroll for me? Okay, so he says that. Um, where is it? 
something about a redesign. Okay, so Touch ID has been canceled as it won't be included in the power button and the chances of its inclusion in screen seems to be low. So I don't know what all that about is about exactly. Uh, people have talked about there being a retinal scanner of some sort or possibly putting the, um, the Touch ID into all of the screen, the entire display, which as you can imagine would suck for us because if they do, then that means we can't replace the screen. Otherwise the customer won't have Touch ID anymore. And the thing that blows my mind is, um, I know, I don't know, 20 people that have an iPhone, and I think one of one or two of them told me that they actually use Touch ID, which is really interesting. Uh, there are some estimates online, I don't know how, know how accurate they are, but they say it's about 15% of users actually use their Touch ID on their iPhone. So it's funny to me that they put all this R&D, you know, all this money into developing something that is probably a feature that we might have had a preference for something else to replace instead of that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Anyway, so the question is this. Um, I, for one, prefer to wait until the S version of any phone comes out. If you remember, historically speaking, when the iPhone 3G came out, it had uh, no video recording. So when they had the 3GS, they added that feature. And if I, I think they actually fixed something else that we had. There was another problem we had with the 3G. It was fixed with the S. When the iPhone 4 came out, they had problems with the signal and they fixed that with the iPhone 4S. And then of course, when the iPhone 5, out, 5 came out, they had all sorts of problems with the power button and they kind of fixed that with the 5S, but not completely. And then of course, when the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus came out, those phones were bendable and they fixed that with the 6S. So um, I ran into this the other day, which I thought was kind of weird. Let's see if I can show you this here. Where'd it go? So not this one, but this one. So I got one of these just a few days ago. And the strange thing is I was in a grocery store. I had my, this is an iPhone seven. I've got it in my pocket. I, I, you know, my body temperature doesn't run any higher than the normal person. I don't think it was a warm day outside, but it wasn't particularly hot. It was probably about 85 or so. I'm in an air conditioned grocery store. You know where you walk around and you get the chills if you go by the refrigerators. I go out to the car plug my phone into the USB charger. I did connect it to my Bluetooth device and started playing some music and then I got this and then my phone just didn't work for about 10 or 15 minutes until it cooled down. So I, I, I'm i confident that one of the issues that we are seeing with the iPhone 7 and especially if you've come across that before is that when you make something highly re water resistant you don't really have anywhere for air to enter or to escape from. So all that heat that's been building up inside here, and remember there was a hissing sound people were hearing uh, from their cameras, I think it was on the 7. Um, that's probably an issue that will be Im at least improved upon, hopefully with the 7S. So uh, I'm just curious. I don't know what you guys are thinking about buying, if your next phone will be an Apple or you know an iPhone or not. Uh, I've looked at the S8 and really I, I have a just a... I don't want to buy a Samsung Galaxy phone again because I'm bitter about the fact that all of their screens are curved now. And you know what a pain that can be to uh, when it comes to repairing them. And secondly, the functionality factor, again, like the Touch ID on the iPhones, how many people care about having a curved screen? I'm sure there are a handful, but I don't think it's a whole lot. At least most of the people that I talk to in news could care less about uh, having a curved screen on their phone. But it looks like all Samsung's phones are gonna be that way from now on. Now they are supposed to be releasing the Note 8 in the near future. And by the way, I wanted to follow up for anyone. I actually saw this question posted today and I wanted to uh, get back to everyone on this. We did get our Galaxy Note 7 refund. Now here was the catch. I requested this thing and I did a video on it where I called up Samsung, got them on the phone, got their RMA number and all that kind of stuff. And that was in December. Now, almost three months later, we still had not got a re, uh, a check back from them. And we're going, okay, we're gonna get our money back, but when's this gonna happen? And I'll cut right to the chase. If you send in a Galaxy Note 7, give them sufficient time to receive it and then call them and follow up. Because the moment we did that, a week and a half later, our check arrived in the mail. So I think it's kind of a two-step process. You do all the paperwork that you need to, you get your Samsung, your Note 7 in the box, send it out to them, and then once they receive it, you're gonna have to call and follow up on it because it doesn't look like they're in any hurry to send that uh, refund back to you. A uh, friend had her iPhone 7 malfunction briefly. I'm reading these out loud because I do this for a podcast, so I want people to know what, I, what we're talking about. 
the home button got extremely hot but cooled down after a hard reset never been opened strange yeah this is my concern with again anything that has a very ip a very high uh, water resistance rating is that there's nowhere for that heat to go and you can test things in a laboratory but until they go out into the public and you have millions of units to undergo millions of different types of um, uh, environments, you know, and to be used by different people for different things. And we know how intensely people use their phones. That, that doesn't surprise me. And I'm really curious as to whether there's going to be some long-term problems later on uh, with the heat building up inside of the phones. So let's see. Um, we were talking, uh, Tiffany, I think you brought this up and I wanted to get back to this real quick. And that was with focusing on good customer service, because again, another one of the, the questions that comes up quite often, especially for people who have just started this business and thought that, oh, I'm gonna fix phones, I know how to fix phones, I'm good at it, therefore I will succeed and make lots of money. And we know that's not exactly how it works for a number of reasons. And I almost, my brother came up with this thing where he, one of his stores was located not far from a mall. And in this particular mall, they didn't do good quality work. And they didn't use good quality parts mainly. So people would go in and say, hey, can I get a quote? And then of course they'll play the mall against you and they'll usually often knock a few dollars off, you know? So if the mall quoted them $59, they'll come in and say, oh, you know, the mall told me it was $50 or 49 or something else like that. You know, we know that's gonna happen. Um, however, what what is difficult to do is to educate the customer in a short period of time about the quality of the equipment that you, or the parts that you use compared to your competition while not trying to sound like you're upselling them to something that they don't really need. So uh, this is one of the big challenges that we face. And what we find is very effective for people who you know don't really care to hear the explanation, and that is that we need to be able to put things in as few words as possible. So I don't wanna pick on malls in general. I know some of you may work in malls or have stores in malls, and absolutely uh, one of the benefits of being a mall is the amount of foot traffic, the, traffic that you're gonna get. One of the downsides is that you will probably have competition and you will uh, also have to pay a ridiculous lease to the mall and be subject to their rules. Uh, but that being said, this particular mall has a, a very well-known problem with the quality on their phones. So when the customers came into the store, you know, his challenge was, how do I explain in a very small number of words that if you go to the mall, you're not getting the same thing you get here? Because that by itself doesn't, you know, it, it communicates the message, but it doesn't really sink in the way it does if you give something a name. So he kind of coined the term mall quality. You know, he had people come in and say, you know, how much do you charge for an iPhone 6S screen? And he would quote the price and they'd say, oh, I can, you know, get it down here at this other store for this amount of money. And he would respond with, well, if you want mall quality, and again, I know that's not fair. I don't really like that term because uh, I actually work for a company that has some stores in malls and they do very good work. So uh, I, I prefer to call it Craigslist quality. And now I'm sure anyone who's using Craigslist for advertising isn't gonna like that either. So um, hopefully there's a better term we can, we can use, but we need to be able to communicate to people immediately that what they're dealing with is not going to be the same quality as what we're using. So, you know, when you, when you throw around the term OEM, that used to mean something, but that term is so bastardized nowadays that OEM doesn't mean anything. You know, we have OEM, OEM copy, we have OEM um, AAA, A plus, and all this stuff. And a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Thomas from Repair Traders, and he did a pretty good job of explaining that. Uh, long story short, there's only so many manufacturers who make screens for phones. You know, there's a handful at best, but what they have in China, where we buy a lot of these parts from are a number of phone assemblers or, or phone part assemblers. So they will buy the same LCD. You can have two different companies that buy the same LCD, but when they put those LCDs together, when they glue them down, when they use you know cold press or hot glue or whatever it is that they use, those procedures are different. And this is where they find a way to cut the cost by a couple of dollars. And we see the result. When you go online and you see an iPhone 6, LCD with touchscreen and glass, you know, the whole display assembly for $12, we have a good idea of what we're getting. But again, when someone comes in to buy something from you, it's difficult to communicate to that one, uh, to communicate that to them, unless you actually have the phone in your hand, you just show them, hey, this is what it looks like after you put it back together. And again, it always comes across as kind of being a sales pitch. Um, but for, for the most part, you will get what you pay for. Uh, if someone calls up for a price, I now engage and educate the customer 
a little for rapport building rather than ABC, XYZ to give. Thank you. That is awesome. And um, I'm not going to give myself credit, but I will say this is something that I try to get across to everyone I train. And that is that being in the repair industry, we see that uh, people who are technically or possess a high technical aptitude sometimes don't have the best people skills. And this is what can make or break your business. You can be the best iPhone uh, repair person. You can be the you can be the best in a number of different things. You know, taking phones apart, you can be the fastest, you can have the best quality parts and so forth. But if you don't have someone in your store that engages the customer and does set up some sort of, uh, you know, establish some rapport or, or, or create some sort of relationship with that customer, you're just another price. And that is what we want to get away from as much as possible. There is something to be said for the in-store experience. You know, you do business. Um, I don't want to name any, any company names because I know that's kind of somewhat distasteful, but there are stores where you can go and buy things really, really cheap and you can find all the stuff you want in one spot. And I won't shop in those stores because I don't enjoy the experience that I have when I go there. I can go down the street to a slightly smaller store. I'll pay a little bit more. It's not a ton. You know, if it was twice as much, obviously that wouldn't make sense. But if it's a small price to pay to go into an environment where you where you feel comfortable and you can trust the people that are offering that service or those goods that you're buying from and you know you can always bring it back if you don't like it it makes a big difference and in addition to that um, we know that there's a category of customers who are only fixing their phones because they're trading them in and this is my one big exception to the rule if someone comes in and says hey i don't care what kind of parts you use all i want to do is turn this phone in because they're going to give me x amount of dollars credit and then i'm going to i'm, I'm going to turn on my fan give me a second here it's getting warm um so if someone is just going to take their phone back to their carrier and all they have to do is show that it still works and that and therefore a $12 iPhone 6 screen is fine for them if i want to keep that on hand sure i'm ha i'll be willing to sell that to them but one of the things about having a an option like that you know like we have the OEM and then we have the aftermarket screen no matter what you tell the customer assuming they're going to keep the phone for any any period of time no matter what you tell the customer that part, that whole conversation is going to be, uh, is going to disappear. You know, it's going to evaporate from their mind in the short term. But what they're going to remember is where they bought the part from. So if you end up giving them one of those really low end parts that gets the job done, but starts developing problems, you know, the color looks different, you know, anything that sticks out in their mind as being low quality, I can tell you nine times out of 10, they're only really going to remember that they're not happy now with what the phone looks like and that they bought it from you. So that's why I have a very difficult time putting my name on something when someone says, oh, well, can you do it cheaper? Yeah, yes, I can do it cheaper. But if I do, and I think that later on, you're not gonna be happy with that, I know that that's gonna come back to haunt me. So um, bravo though, Tiffany, that is that is how you do it, absolutely. Um, let's see, did I miss a comment here? Uh, no, I think we're good. Uh, let's see, okay, so question, what do you all think about offering employees a commission on phone repairs? So if you work for someone else or if you have employees or if you were to hire someone to work for you, would you do you think that paying a commission for completing repairs would be a good idea, a bad idea? Just throwing it out there because I'm, I'm um, curious myself. I've seen a few different ways that people have it set up and I've seen kind of some positive aspects and some negative aspects and it all kind of comes down to the same thing and that is whether your employees are more concerned with doing a good job or finding a way to kind of work the system and earn as much as money as they can. So there's kind of a there's kind of a happy medium in there, you know. It all, it it really requires qualification of the person that you're working with in my experience. Now that may be, you know, may or may not be true for other people, but we do open up Things like, okay, let me get this done as fast as I can, which we know may lead to some uh, follow-up problems later on. And we will eliminate usually the problem of someone who drags their feet and takes a very long time to complete. You know, If we were to say, you're gonna get an hourly rate no matter what, then there's really no incentive to get that repair done fast. And really the better job you do, the more time you take, the less chances that customer is gonna come back to complain about it which is a concern even if you're not making con uh, commission because you don't want to have to deal with that situation. But I'm just curious, what do you guys think? Um, 
I think that was most of what I had on my agenda today. So uh, uh, this was kind of a trial. I wanted to make sure this worked. I wanted to uh, see if this was a good time for people to come on. I'm happy we have some engagement here. This is really awesome. I tentatively plan to do this every Monday and I will have a list of topics prepared beforehand. And then of course, if anyone has uh, things they wanna bring up or questions or anything like that, um, definitely open to that. Let's see, no, if they got a commission for a successful repair, should they be penalized if the repair is a failure or takes twice as long due to their complications? Here's the, yeah, that's the tricky part. Um, good question. And a lot of that will come down to labor laws as well, because in certain states, you're not really allowed to penalize people. So I believe that you can offer them a net commission, you know, in California, for example, uh, you could say, if you do X amount of repairs today, you get a bonus of this dollar amount. And if you meet that goal, then you make that commission. But it's very difficult to legally say, but if you cause this other problem, we're gonna take back a percentage of that commission. So uh, my understanding is that at least where I live, that you can offer an incentive and if they achieve that goal, they get that commission, but you have to be really careful about saying that you're gonna deduct something from anyone's paycheck. Um, when it's when it comes to hourly employees, at least I'm not sure about um, about salaried um, commission pay only works for high volume work. Uh, this was great breakfast time for Dave. Hey, thank you all so much for uh, joining me. I'm gonna keep this open for about another five minutes. If anyone has comments or questions to put up here or ideas for the next live stream. This is a lot of fun. Again, I really enjoy doing this way more than just standing there and talking into a microphone. Uh, next week, I'm hoping to have a capture card for my microscope so that I can kind of take you under the scope with me because to try to explain something at a microscopic level, uh, it, you just can't do it. You've got to be able to see what's going on. And I got this whole thing put together. I got the DSLR, I got the scope, I got all the software I need. And what do you know? There's no way to output from a DSLR without a special card. One more thing that I get to buy. So, but it's all tax deductible, right? Alrighty. So I'm going to go to, let's see. Um, was there one more thing here? Oh, we got the letter. Yeah, that's it. That covered everything I had. That was awesome to see you all show up. This is great. I can really see doing this um, much more often. Let's see, Textalizer. Y'all heard about Textalizer? I thought this was kind of interesting. I think I, I think I brought this up on another, uh, on a previous podcast. I'm gonna just go to the browser here real quick. This is interesting uh, while we're just kind of shooting it here. So they have this thing that supposedly they're doing a test run on in New York where if you get pulled over, they take your phone and they plug it into a tablet in order to determine whether or not you are texting and driving or talking and driving. So what do you think of that? Uh, there are obviously some questions regarding privacy and a number of other things, but on top of that, they're saying that this particular device will not be able to detect if someone was, for example, uh, posting something on Facebook or playing with Instagram or anything else like that. So I'm not sure about the effectiveness level. Obviously, there, there's the privacy concern. But on top of that, when you talk to people, and it's really sad that there are people who still think that texting and driving is a good idea or something they're willing to do, that uh, they could probably carry around a spare phone. And what would stop them from handing that phone that's not being used over rather than the one that they were actually talking and texting on? I'm not... I'm not uh, condoning that. I'm just saying um, I see a lot of holes in this thing and it's kind of weird. Uh, let's see. As an owner, you benefit from employees' good work and you also have to absorb unforeseen costs. Yeah, that, and that's the thing. Um, it, it's easy for people that I talk to who run their own businesses to kind of feel the tendency towards a double standard. Like I want my employees to do really good, but I'm not sharing the profit with them. So when they make a mistake and they destroy something, if if they're not part of that profit structure, then yeah, you can't penalize them. That is part of the cost of doing business and hopefully your management skills will overcome or eliminate any of those problems that you have around your shop. So I agree 100%. Let's see, can I do a, I think I can, no, I can't chat from here. I thought I could. Let's see if we can do it from the browser. Oh, you know, I actually did have one more and it was a question and I get these questions a lot too, and they're very difficult to understand. So what I have is a Droid Razor HD XT926. Yes, people are still fixing these. It blows my mind, but uh, there are a lot of parts of the world where 
uh, they don't throw things away right after they use them for a short period of time. So here's a question though. Uh, M. Usman Kokar, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sir, my mobile screen is correct, but it is working. What can I do? How to make it? Now, I am confident there is someone on the other end of this comment who that makes complete sense to, but there's probably a language barrier. So I interpret this to mean that his screen is cracked, but it's still working. So um, how do I make it? How do you make it like new again? Well, you replace the screen. I guess that's the short answer. What I'm, what I'm getting here is he's probably trying to determine whether or not he needs to replace the screen. Well, uh, if it's cracked and you can live with it, not necessarily, at least not if it's at least as long as it's not an LG because those tend to go bad right away. But uh, other than that, I would say you probably wanna fix the glass. And if you don't, put something on it, some tape, um, glass protector, whatever. Uh, Sans and Papyrus. I noticed the higher increase in texting since Uber and Lyft rolled out. I've had numerous close calls from being run over. Yeah, um, I've had some people do some silly things and I'm pretty old school, but when I got my driver's license, they made it very clear that there are usually two reasons for every accident. And that's usually gonna be something, gonna be one party doing something that they shouldn't be doing, and then the other party not re reacting to that. So it's unfortunate, but that is the, wor the way that things work, right? We have to watch out for the other people on the road, and I'm with you 100%. I, when I drive by, and I see somebody looking down at their phone and I know exactly doing what they're doing. It drives me nuts because, you know, um, there are all sorts of people on the road, families and children and, you know, older people and all, you know, the whole spectrum. And there you are being self-important and driving around, looking at your phone instead of looking at the road, pull over. But I, 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 I have an, a feeling that within the next few years, something is going to change uh, dramatically, whether it be self-driving cars or some sort of technology that's built into cars to prevent texting and driving, but it's definitely a real problem. I mean, statistically, it's supposed to be more dangerous on average. I use that term loosely, but on average, texting and driving is more distracting, uh, more of an impact on driving than the average person who's under the influence of alcohol. So that's pretty scary. Um, elderly people texting with two hands. Oh my God, that's scary. That is really scary. Uh, okay. So it's three o'clock, I'm gonna get out of here. Thanks again so much for joining me. I'm gonna make every effort to do this again next Monday. I know there's a slight delay, so I'm gonna wait about 20 seconds before I close this chat. Um, and that's it, that's all I got. Okay, I thought I could put up a still image and see my chat, but I can't. So I have to go back to the stream. So let's do this. And thank you. And can I comment? Oh, that's what I'm that's what I was trying to do a long time ago. Let's see if I can get this chat to work. Uh, there we go. Where's that hundred percent thing that I can never find? <laughs> Oh, well. I think that worked. All right. Catch you next time.